Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. Great to be here. My name is Lorna, and I'm here to talk to you about debugging HTTP. Let's start with the debugging. There are six recognized stages in the process of debugging. Some of them may be familiar to you. The first is denial. That cannot happen. The second is frustration. It doesn't happen on my machine. This may translate as, it was perfectly fine when I deployed it two hours ago. <laughs> I may move on to, I've never seen it do that before. The third phase is the disbelief, like, this is the you cannot be serious phase of debugging. The next stage is where we start to get a bit more constructive about it. I call it the curious phase. You are done with kind of the emotional response, and you're now into using your skills to look at and solve the problem. So we start to look at why something has gone wrong and how we can understand the problem. It once we do, gotcha. That's when the light comes on, and you proceed to relief and wonder how this ever worked. <laughs> this is familiar to you, and I kind of wanted to open with that because I want to make the point that fault finding with HTTP, trying to debug problems in an increasingly interconnected world, is really much like fault finding everywhere else in the project. My background's in electronic engineering, and the theories of you know, testing things, get the multimeter out, look at what's going on. It's the same kind of attitude. When you debug, it's usually finding the problem that is the hardest part. I am going to, today, try and show you some tools that will help you to find and understand the problems in your system. Uh, we'll talk about reproducing the problem. I'm going to show you Wireshark for inspecting traffic, curl for making any kind of HTTP request in the world that you might want to, and Charles proxy for some other clever tricks that might come in handy. So this is my attempt to allow all of you <laughs> to kind of look over my shoulder at the tools that I use. I do a lot of PHP and a specifically API development. Um, these are the tools that I use, and I want to try, <laughs> try and scale that up. So I'm quite enthusiastic about this, um, and I hope that you all get something from it. The tools are really important. Understanding your tools really well is what will allow you to find the problems and be the hero under pressure. It's about making the most of your tools and getting to know what they can do. I'm going to start with a tool called Curl. Curl is one of my favorite tools. It tends not to be well loved by PHP developers, and I think that's a combination of um, not all of us are command line nuts. I will tell you now that I am a command line nut and use Twitter from the command line. Um, not all of us are. Also, um, the, so PHP has this thing called a curl extension. I don't know if you've ever used it, but it has basically the worst interface of any extension in the world ever. So if you think that is curl, then yeah, I would hate it too. Curl is a command line tool, it's a multi-tool, it's a Swiss army knife. It does everything you could possibly need it to do. The man page for curl is, I'm going to say substantial, <laughs> OK? There's a lot to it. But in fact, there are only a few switches that I ever use. This slide is titled, Curl is your friend, because I really think it can be. I really think it can be a really good way of working with HTTP. So here is the Lorna man page for things you actually need to know about curl, and we'll leave all those other switches aside. I use the dash x with a verb to say what kind of request I'm making. So it might be get or post. I work a lot with RESTful APIs, so put, delete, patch, head, options, other things not yet invented by HTTP. Curl does have some specific switches for 
sending a get request, sending a post request. It doesn't have them for every possible verb, so I always use dash x. Dash h to send a header value, and you literally quote the key colon value pair that you want to send. And if you want to send another header, then you send another dash h switch. You're going to see these in a demo that I do in a moment. Dash d is for data. If you just do dash d with key value pairs, by default, curl will send that as a post request and send them as if you had submitted them from a web form, which is often what we're trying to do. You can send a series of key value pairs. You can send a string in another format. Or you can just give the name of a file to take data from. So you're testing actually sending data to an API. That data on the command line can kind of just make it wrap and wrap and wrap and wrap. So you can put the data just into a file and load it each time, edit it, load it again. Very useful. Dash S, I mentioned because I'm about to show you, um, it's the silent switch. So if you want to, pi to pipe the output of curl to something else, which isn't your terminal, curl will detect this and try and helpfully give you a progress bar. I'm not sure if I'm using it wrong, but basically that's never what I want it to do. So dash S to suppress that output of the progress bar and just get the output of curl piped to whatever it was you wanted. I mean, it might just be less, because the output's quite long. You choose. Dash C and dash B used together give you cookies in the way that your browser would do it. So the dash C is for capturing the cookie, so you use dash C, and then a file name argument, which is called the cookie jar, in case anyone doubted that HTTP geeks have a sense of humor. Dash B is for broadcasting the cookie. So if all of your requests have dash C and a cookie jar file name, dash B and another cookie jar file name, you're doing the same thing as your browsers will do by convention in terms of accepting cookies and then resending them for subsequent requests. So if you need to test with curl, you need to log in or whatever, it's all in there. Finally, the dash V switch is really useful because it shows you request and response headers. So you can just have a look at what was sent and what was received, which is great to talk about. And now I'd like to show you. So please come and meet my good friend, Curl. Like I say, it's a command line tool. So I am going to make a get request with Curl from the command line. This is a request to my local development copy of the API for the joined in open source project. That's because I'm the project lead of the joined in open source project. And much of my spare time mostly looks like this <laughs> as I work on developing the API. Pretty much all of the examples that you'll see today have the joined in project as, it, as, its, um, as its example partly because I'm the project lead, so this is where I spend like, a, good a good chunk of my time, but also because it's open source. So if you want to jump in and look at this stuff, be my guest. It's out there for you to look at. So I'm making a curl request to api.joinedin.local, which is my dev version of the API, and to a URL, which is events, a specific event identifier, and comments. So this is the collection of comments made on a specific event. The conference here have asked you all to leave comments on talks and comments on events. So this is the kind of thing that we would be doing. After this session, you will be able to do that with curl, should you so choose. So I run that command, and curl literally just spits back the response to me. It's JSON. I have an empty comments array. There's a meta block telling me, telling me there is a count of zero records um, in my response. And there's some links to pagination going on there. Cool. So far, so good. Let's take that a step further. And instead of JSON, let's send an accept header of text HTML. If you hit api.join.in in your browser right now, you will get an HTML rendered output of the data in the API. There's no access control for read-only, so absolutely be my guest. 
It, that's done on your accept header. So your browser will say, I understand HTML, and joined in server will be like, all right, here it is. So I can send that header with curl. A few other things then that we can also do with curl from the command line. Um, again, making that basic request. If I add the dash V switch, we get extra information about the headers that were sent and the headers that came back in the response. See, if you have a look at this, the arrows coming from the left into the screen, those are the request headers. I made a get request. It, curl sends a user agent. You can override that if you want to pretend to be something else. Well, there's a host header. Curl very optimistically claims to accept star slash star. The response headers coming from the middle of the screen back out to the side, that's what's coming back from the server. The response headers tell us we got a response, it's 200 OK, there's some date information, some Apache PHP information, content length and content type. So that tells us how to understand the body. If something has gone wrong, the dash V allows you to inspect the status code, the response types. A lot of PHP frameworks and tools will usually return you JSON, except if you fire their exception handlers, they get like a default web thing, so you can get a 200 OK, and when you look closely, the content type is HTML, and the contents are a big error message. So um, that can sometimes be something that you would use curl for. Uh, one more thing before we go on and start actually posting data with curl, and that is to show you a nicer format of this JSON output that we do. Um, I need the dash S switch because I'm going to pipe this JSON output to something else. And what I'm going to do here is pipe it to a Python extension called json.tool. I'm rubbish at pausing before I press return. <laughs> dash M json.tool. And all that does is give you a nice pretty print output of your JSON, makes it a bit more humane to read. There are a few other ways you might do this. A nice tool called HTTP IE gives you much, much prettier output um, for JSON, but has less logical command line arguments, in my opinion. So I just, I just, I understand curl, so I'm always back there using curl. So that's lovely, and I think we should move on now and start to create data using curl. We don't just consume things. Often, we need to interact in more assertive ways with the tools that we use. It's a RESTful-ish. Don't call it RESTful. People will hunt you down and set fire to you. It's an HTTP web service that we have on the joined-in API. Um, so in order to create a new record, you post to the collection that it will be, um, it will be added to. Join in saying API actually does have some quite good documentation, but often you will be fighting in the dark with somebody else's API. And curl is my pointy stick for this, <laughs> for this purpose. I know I need to post, but I'm not really sure what else I need to do. So let's just post. And it comes straight back. You must be logged in to create data. I just told you you could click around on your browser. You can, but you can't write without being logged in. Joined in uses OAuth, so you can see I'm changing focus here just to copy and paste the access token that I made earlier. So I will send an authorization header, OAuth access token. There it is. Let's see what happens. OK. I tried to post an empty request. You must be logged in. I try logging in, and the next error message is different. This is an important thing to know about debugging. If you get an error message and you do something, and then you get a different error message, you're making progress. You're probably heading in the right direction. <laughs> you get the same error message over and over and over again, you're probably not making progress. If you <laughs> a new error message, that qualifies as progress. Keep trying, OK? Um, right, so we need to post a field called comment, all right? Now, obviously, I have some inside information. I already know that I need to send JSON. So we'll send the content type header. Content type is an entity header. So usually, we see it in the response of an HTTP um, request response pair. And that's usually because responses have bodies. 
If you need to send a body with your request, you're still going to send a content type header. So content type is an entity header. You send it when you have a body to send. So there's the content type, and we'll send the actual data. I'm just going to put the JSON on the command line here because it's one field. Um, I'll even realize that I need quotes in this screencast. And when I get to the end and post that, boom. It looks like nothing happened. RESTful APIs can be a little bit Unix command line. <laughs> okay? Sometimes they can be a little bit terse. So, hmm, what did happen there? Well, we've already seen the dash V switch, so let's just run that again and have a look. Here it comes. Put the dash V switch in, run it again, and look at the headers of the request and response that came back. Handily, I hope this font size is big enough for you to see, because it was the perfect size to get everything on the screen, more by luck than judgment. So again, the request headers are those that are coming into the screen from the left. And we sent a post request, user agent host, accept some content type, the auth header that you saw that I needed, some content length to go with that JSON that we sent. Coming back, so going back out the screen that way, 201 created. And read down a few more lines, a location header. That's very normal for a RESTful service. You've created something, and your status code, instead of being 200, will be 201 created. And then you get the redirect to the thing that you just made. And you can see it's a specific event comment URL that we get in the location header. Um, so actually, when I did that, I created a record on my remote server. Well, on my laptop, because this is my local dev copy. And we can verify that. We can go back and use the same request that we used earlier. You can watch me key up through my history, pipe it through the pretty print, and here we go. My meta block is showing me a count of two, and if I scroll up now, then I can see there's not one but two fab event comments being added there. So using curl, I have kind of come to a new API, made some requests, tried making a post request, and kind of iterated to find what the correct HTTP request would be. I don't need to do that like fighting with my application and working out how to use the intermediate libraries. I just poke at it on the command line until it does what I want. It's a bit like developing the correct SQL statement from the command line or in your, in your workbench tools and then dropping it into your application. It's kind of the parallel to how I use curl in that kind of setting. So. Slides. Yes. Uh, there's the link to the Python JSON library that I just used, um, in case you're interested. Any Python you like, just pipe it through to python-m json.tool, and it'll give you that pretty print. Um, makes it a bit easier if you are working with JSON often. My next tool to show you today is Wireshark. Wireshark's amazing. Um, just like curl, and I should have said this already, just like curl, it is um, available cross-platform, and it's free to use, so just download it and try it. Wireshark inspects the traffic that's going through your network card. You'll see when I start it, I get to choose between the network cards in the machine. And I love it because I don't need to edit the applications. Sometimes I may not have any control over one or the other of them, Sometimes I might just not care enough to get in and start finding where the requests are made from, where I should put some var dump or some error log commands in. Just, you have a problem, you can reproduce the problem. Start Wireshark, get the problem, have a look at Wireshark, what happened? You're able to observe the traffic. If you need to capture traffic which is not on the same machine as you're going to run Wireshark on, so let's say that you need to grab this off a server which you don't want to put the GUI tool on. You can capture traffic with a tool called TCP dump, which does the same thing, and you can examine it later with Wireshark. So I'm going to show you Wireshark in a kind of live capture scenario, but you can download, capture data on a, on a server and download it. Equally, you can capture it locally, save it later, show it to somebody else, look at it again. Um, it doesn't have to be the live capture. 
It's also very useful if you have what I call a Heisen bug. Something which is broken until you put the debug in, and then it's fixed, and then you take the debug out, and then it's broken, and then, right? <laughs> so there's a few people nodding at me <laughs> from the audience. Yeah, Wireshark doesn't interfere with your application, so it's just a separate thing. I find it most useful when I'm debugging between layers. The example that I'm going to show you is the new joined in site. Um, the Web2 site that we're working on talks to an API backend. So now I'm in a situation where it's not me, like browser, web server, something's gone wrong, var dump, see it in the browser, because it's browser, web server, web server, API, <laughs> API, other API, API database, you tell me. So you can have connections between lots of different elements of quite a service-oriented architecture. Things get further and further away. That's becoming much more normal for PHP developers. I'm building a lot of APIs. Some of them are mobile backends. Some of them are part of websites. So these are skills that are handy and indispensable when you need to work in a setup that looks like this. This is the joined in setup. So the API you've just seen. Um, Web2 is the site I'm about to show you. We've got an Android app. Who knows what else is consuming that API? It's publicly available, right? I don't know and I don't need to know. You build what you will. So my second demo is called, why doesn't this work? Oh, <laughs> it's the noise that I make when I use Wireshark. OK, this is the new joined in site. If you're interested in the project, um, hit m.joined.in to see the real one of these, not the test data version. I have Laura Mipsonum in here because once upon a time, many years ago, Josh built the project a really nice sample data generator so you can install joined in and instantly get a set of data to work with. But it's all a bit nonsense in Latin. Uh, this is my dev system, so that's what you're seeing. So this is the Web2 project, and I'm just going to click into a random event and have a go at creating a comment because I've had a bug reported with this functionality. So I make a very plausible comment, and I submit it. And sure enough, there's an error. So I'd like you to meet my good friend Wireshark. All I need to do is start Wireshark. Here I'm choosing my local network card because my uh, dev copies of joined in are on the same laptop. So uh, my machine will route all the network for that to the, through that network card rather than out through my WLAN card. Um, this is useful because it also means that I don't capture all the Googling for Stack Overflow that goes on while I'm debugging a problem. You just get the traffic that goes to your local card. So I start the capture. And one thing I always do here is I add an HTTP filter. That's because Wireshark's a network level tool. It's, it doesn't understand HTTP. It's not really about the web. It's about network traffic. And so it's very low level and networky. And it shows me things I don't understand, like DNS and UDP and TCP. And I'm making a web request from a web browser, and that's what I want to see. So I always add this little filter to kind of just show me things that I really want to see. Start Wireshark, reproduce the problem, get back over to the browser, submit that thing again, see the error again. Awesome. Come back then to Wireshark. And let's have a look at what happened. Well, the top pane is a list of requests and responses separately. So this is like a story of what has happened. The lower pane is drill down detail, detail on a single response. So you can see that I did get a 500 internal server error. Before that, I got a 400 bad request. So website requests, um, browser requests, website, website requests, API. API responds, website, web server responds. This is the 500 leg, <laughs> but the 400 actually came back from the API. If I drill into what request was sent, who can see the problem with this? You probably can't on the projector. My access token seems to have a PHP variable name in it. I, instead of sending however many characters of hex, I would appear to be sending dollar this arrow access token. Mmm, I think I can see the problem. 
That's a problem that would be quite difficult to see without a tool like this that lets you drill in to the request that the web server made to another external service. So, okay, let's have a go at fixing that. We're going to go into the application, and instead of you watching me type PHP, instead we'll just um, go to the branch I made earlier and check out the one that doesn't have this bug. This is open source, right? So I also had to then, I can't check out master because I had to patch a different bug that I found while I was trying to take this screencast. Awesome, good. So let's just give that another go, submit the comment again, and there we go. This time it's worked because I've been able to inspect the problem, go in and fix where I was sending the access token header. So having Wireshark running allows you to look at a problem that's happening and um, inspect what's going on even a few layers down the stack. For straight PHP back-end kind of web front-end development, it's still really handy. You don't need multi-tiers to make use of Wireshark. Um, if you're doing ajax -y requests, or you just want to have a look at the traffic without editing your application, fabulous tool. And I used just Wireshark for years and years. Um, right. Good, we're doing okay for time. This is good. I worried I brought too much stuff, but there was nothing I wanted to not tell you. So <laughs> all of the content is still in the talk. We just have to get through it all somehow. My next tool is a tool called Charles Proxy. And in contrast to both Curl and Wireshark, Charles Proxy is not free. It's cross-platform. It's not free. It might be the only software I have paid for in about eight years, something like that. Charles Proxy costs $50. That was £29.98 earlier in the week. It makes its money back pretty quickly, so don't take the paid-for license and hold it against it. It's a fabulous tool. Charles allows you to do a bunch of things. A lot of what you can do with Charles, you can do with Wireshark. It allows you to observe requests. Charles is specifically a web debugging proxy. So it has a better understanding of web requests and responses. It joins them up in pairs, so you can see the request and response together. There is a Firefox plugin. Charles proxy is a true proxy. Your traffic goes from your browser or whatever. You're about to see an example with a phone into Charles, out the other side of Charles, and then off wherever it was going. It's a true proxy. Wireshark just sort of observes the traffic. Charles is a proxy. There's a Firefox plugin that you just plug in, enable it in Firefox. So you can go to Firefox and be like, turn on Charles, run Charles, do whatever you were doing in Firefox. The traffic goes through Charles. Very, very easy to set up. Really easy to set up. Um, on Ubuntu, with the permissions for Wireshark, it's probably easier to set up Charles. As well as observing requests, Charles Proxy allows you to change requests. You can rewrite any request you like in any way you like. So you can make the host names different, send some extra headers. Had one recently where someone tried to tell me that I couldn't talk to his SOAP service because I was sending the wrong uh, accept headers. I couldn't talk to his soap service because he hadn't actually published his soap service. Anyway, I proved this by rooting through Charles, setting the headers he said I needed, and sure enough, it didn't help. You can also use Charles as a network proxy. Charles is not just about what's running on this machine. I'm going to show you a, a demo where I am running on this machine, and then I'm going to show you a demo where Charles is going to interfere with my mobile phone requests. So if you need to network something else on the same wireless network as you through your laptop to use Charles as a proxy, go for it. Charles also has very nice um, ability to repeat requests, change requests, and you can save and load different requests or sessions. So in terms of um, using it within a team, if you're all using Charles, understand that um, quite a few organizations now are starting to have the corporate license. If you've got a bunch of developers, it's really worth it. Um, you can see something, save that request, 
attach it to the, to the bug tracker, just drop it into the ticket, somebody else can load it and replicate that problem immediately. So it's none of this login as so-and-so, so login as somebody who's got admin privileges and such and such a role, then if you change your profile and go to, save it in Charles, run it in Charles. It just cuts out all the messing about and very, very easy to replicate problems. Um, I could talk about Charles all day. Um, you might hate me, although feel free to just find me later and I'll keep going. I wrote quite a long article and it's uh, written tutorial style. So if you want to sort of look again at some of the things I've shown you with Charles today, go there. It's an article for Tech Portal. Hopefully you've seen Invika downstairs with their Tech Portal. Really nice outlet to write for, so if you're thinking of writing, go and write for there. I wrote about Charles Proxy, so go and read that for the things that I didn't have time to tell you. Okay, first one of the Charles demos is called A Few Charles Proxy Tricks. So the only thing you need to notice here is that I'm using Wireshark. Normally I use Chrome at uh, Wireshark. Come on, Firefox. This isn't gin, but should be. And that's the live joined in, m.join.in is the live web2 project. Took this about a week ago, so PHP UK hasn't floated up. Sunshine PHP was still on. Uh, great, cool, lovely. We click around, see some requests coming in. This is Charles. Same kind of idea to Wireshark in that the top half is the story. There are two tabs there, so you can see it in a sequence or see the structure. The structure kind of shows you URL stems, so you can look at sort of classifications of, of requests. I always use it in sequence. It's just the way my brain works. The lower pane on this screen is detail of the specific request response pair that you are looking at. So I'm clicking around on the site. I'm in Firefox. Firefox is proxying through Charles. Charles is showing me all of the traffic. This is lovely. Um, we can scroll up and have a look. If I click into Sunshine PHP, so I focus Sunshine PHP in the top half of the screen, and down here I'm getting the detail on Sunshine PHP. The overview gives you a bunch of requests and responses here. Um, you get lots of information about the transaction. If Charles has applied some rewrite rules or something, you'll also see them here. Cunningly, I didn't manage to get that in the screencast where I had actually done that. So you would see them here. You can get detailed information about the request. So here we're seeing the headers. You can check which cookies were sent. The response comes back. Because this is a web response, it's HTML, then Charles knows that. It reads the content type header and it shows me an HTML tab. I can also check out the headers that I got with the response and have a look at it in text format. You'll see a later example where I've got JSON and it renders it as JSON instead of as HTML. So it's quite clued up with the kinds of things that we might be doing with web requests. Um, Wireshark, like I say, a bit more networky, uh, technical term. Charles Proxy, a bit more web oriented in the way that it works. So that's the HTML view there. It's all very pretty and lovely. You can see I've got some. Very nice comments on Sunshine PHP, because apparently it was an amazing event. I wasn't there. So let's have a look at Charles's rewrite functionality. The request is going to come from the browser into Charles, and Charles is going to fiddle a little bit before it sends that request on. Here's one I made earlier. If I enable this rule here, what we've got is this box up here is which domains the rule will apply to. So I'm applying it to m.join.in, the Web2 project you just saw. And the rule that's being applied is in the rules box a bit further down, where the host m.join.in will become m.joinedin.local, which is, of course, my dev copy. So we'll press OK on that, set up the rewrite rule, pop back over to uh, Firefox. Come on, pop back over to Firefox. And let's have a look. We can see that we're hitting m.joinedin.local. And if I scroll down there, that's not the live site. 
that's the sample data of my local request. So I've set up the rewrite rule, and my next set of requests make this happen. So I've got sample data. Look at the address bar. The browser thinks it's hitting m.join.in. So this is kind of a contrived example, because I'm just showing you that I can make a, the browser think it's hitting one thing, and I'm hitting something else, so I can play with my, I can play with my dev copy. This is really useful when you need to work on a test copy of a website and all the assets are pointing to the hard-coded domain, or WordPress doesn't know to move its folder name, or any of those problems where it's just like, this isn't quite right, or I'm working on a development copy so all the images are broken. Root it through Charles, fix it. Lots and lots of little bits and pieces we can do in all areas of what we do, we're actually just rooting it in, and the Firefox plugin is, I'd like to say idiot-proof, I have my moments, but for the most part, I find it very painless and, and easy to work with. So that's part one of what I wanted to show you with Charles. There's a bunch of things that you can do um, in terms of the rewrites. You can also do other things. The Web 2 is aimed at being a bit friendlier to smaller screens and also aimed at being used on rubbish connections. Now, we're not on a rubbish connection because this event is held at the brewery. But most joined-in usage comes from conferences, and most conferences have either dreadful local connection or no local connection, so everybody's on a mobile connection. Charles has a throttling option, so you can develop with a simulated 3G connection and get a sense of what this would be like for a user who isn't in your office on decent internet connection. So you can get a real sense of how that would work. I'm going to try not to talk about Charles all day. We should get out of here in time for the next talk. OK, so here is another trick that I want to show you with Charles. And I mentioned that it can be a network proxy. So you can put other devices on the network, let's say, for example, a phone, um, proxy them through Charles. So it's not just web requests or things on your laptop that you set the proxy settings for. It's a, it's a network proxy. It's got a port open. So the first thing I've done is I've run IF config, and I need to check what my wireless network card IP address is, because that's where the proxy is. So stay with me. 10, 1, 0, 53. Awesome. Use the phone. So we get on the phone, and we set up the network to proxy through that address. Go to the Wi-Fi settings. This is an Android phone. You need 4.0 or later. Don't ask me why. My personal mobile isn't. Modify the network. Scroll down. Tick the Show Advanced Options. Proxy settings to Manual. And put in that same IP address and the port number. By default, Charles is on 8888. But you can, if you have something else on there, you can set it in Charles. So as soon as you do that with the phone, I'm on the same wireless network, put in the IP address, then we go back to Charles, and this happens. As soon as the phone tries to connect through the proxy, Charles warns you, and it tells me that 101052, the phone, is trying to make a connection. This is so that you can run an open proxy on a network and not have all kinds of things coming through your machine. It might be interesting to have all kinds of things coming through your machine, depending what network you're on. <laughs> but on the whole, not brilliant practice. So you get a warning, and you need to expressly allow this. So OK, I meant to do that, so we'll allow that. And you can see the requests coming in now hitting api.join.in. Because I'm running the joined in Android app on the Android phone that I'm using for the example. Hmm. OK, so that's interesting. Straight away, we're at a point where we can debug mobile apps. I do quite a lot of API development, but I don't always do the mobile end. Um, I have code in the joined in Android app, <laughs> but not a lot. <laughs> um, but straight away, I can start to kind of get in with those tools. I don't need to run any special debugging on the phone. I just route it through the laptop. It's hitting my API, and I've got some insight then into what's going on on that platform. The API, you've already seen this, speaks JSON. So we hit the page, and we see the PHP tech 
It's an upcoming event, so it's far in the future. Hot events, Sunshine PHP. You just saw that on the website. So we're hitting api.join.in. Charles knows it's JSON, so it shows us JSON and JSON text. JSON, just raw JSON, JSON text. Slightly more readable JSON. We saw that the HTML request showed us HTML. Uh, and indeed, if I was web browsing, you would see that as well. Let's have a play with the rewrite rules again. Um, OK, so <laughs> that's the mobile rule that I set up earlier. We're going to swap over now and rewrite api.join.in to api.joinedin.local. And so now I've got the shiny new edition of the Android app. At one point, I thought I was going to have a screencast of an Android app that you can't use yet. But we shipped about two days ago, so feel free to download or update it. Rewriting api.join.in to api.joinedin.local. Haven't recompiled the app. I've just set some settings in Charles. And we can save those settings, refresh some pages. And we're getting 403 forbidden on an event icon. Classy. Right. So now we're getting the test data that you saw earlier because the app is now hitting. It doesn't know it's hitting my dev copy, but it is. And if I show you the app, then here's the data for sunshine.php. And we can just reload, make sure that we're doing that. Set the settings in Charles. Reload it again. That's my dev data. So I'm working with an app that I may not rebuild, may not be able to rebuild. If it's an iPhone app, I don't have the tools or the platform. But I can work against a test version of the API, change the back-end API, do some debugging, observe it with Charles, change it with Charles, realize that I've got a PHP variable name in my access token. Um, <laughs> any of those other things that could happen. Find this very powerful because um, I do API stuff. I don't really do web stuff. So um, having Charles allows me to debug not only the web things, but also other devices. And I think that is becoming increasingly relevant. Whether you're doing apps or whether you're just doing a lot of device testing, maybe you care what your uh, site looks like on different sizes of screen, different resolutions, different network speeds. Charles can give you all of that. And you can save the sessions and evaluate them later. Really, really powerful tool. OK. One other thing that I wanted to talk about with Charles, excuse me while I try and work technology, jolly good, OK, is SSL. You can do SSL with Wireshark, but you need the server key. So if it's your server, you can feed the same keys in, and uh, Wireshark can do some SSL. Charles does SSL very nicely. It is a classic man-in-the-middle attack. So what happens with Charles and SSL is your browser, or whatever, makes a request to Charles. Charles does the handshake with you for that leg. Charles then requests the remote server and uses the normal remote server SSL cert and does the, the encryption for that. But this leg. Charles is, being, is, being, is doing the SSL handshake with you. So the, the certificate won't match what the server should be. Um, this is the experience that you get is like when you've created your own test certificate. So you're developing an SSL site. You're not buying it yet because you're not live. So in your browser, you see something like this. You need to confirm the exception. For devices, um, Charles is a certificate authority. So you can, you can install the CA onto the device um, if you're doing more than just like confirming it in Wireshark. Then you could do SSL like this. So this is, again, something that um, I widely use Charles for. It's got SSL in the, in the sentence. <laughs> I tend to use Charles as my tool of choice because it is really good for this. Um, doing the what you'd expect SSL with the remote site, and then once you hit Charles, it's re-signing it. So your browser will do the SSL, um, but it's, there's, a, there's a man in the middle attack going on there. Um, yeah, OK. So I think I've covered most things that I wanted to. The thing about talking about HTTP tools is it doesn't matter what I talk about, but somebody always comes up to me afterwards angry 
because there's a fabulous tool in the world and I didn't mention it. And there are some fabulous tools in the world trying to show you over my shoulder insight into the ones that I use. There are a bunch of others. These are the ones that people most get angry about me not mentioning. So I really think that some of these may be worth a look. In particular, the curl stuff that I did at the beginning I think curl is a key skill, but it isn't particularly humane. So if you would rather use a GUI tool, um, if that's more your style of working, then we are all different, and one of these may be the right thing. Um, HTT, I'm not sure if it's HTTP, HTTPIE, is a really nice tool, still command line, a bit more modern than curl, perhaps, really pretty JSON output. If you need to do like documentation or anything, use this for your JSON output. It does pigments and everything. It's lovely. It's a Python tool. Um, we've got Fiddler, which is a RESTful HTTP requesting tool. Um, for your browser, there are nice tools built in for Postman for Chrome, REST client for Firefox. There are ways that you can use your in-browser tools to make different kinds of HTTP requests, uh, inspect the responses, get involved with those in different ways. Um, there are a lot of GUIs. Um, a lot of the IDEs also have some kind of requesty, plug-in-y. I'm a Vim user. I don't know what that is. But there are things in your IDE. You should press the buttons if that's a tool that you enjoy using. Should have gone and picked the brains of the JetBrains the, the jet people. But um, whatever tools you're using, understanding the principles of HTTP, understanding how those tools work is really, really key. Debugging is it's about attitude. Sometimes you might say it's about experience. You know, the more you've earned your, <laughs> your stripes through predominantly bad experiences, <laughs> the better you are at debugging. But I don't think you have to necessarily learn it all the hard way. I think having a good attitude to understanding where in the system something could be happening, understanding which tools are available and which can help you, and then knowing how to apply those tools to find the problem. Fixing the problem, whole different ballgame. Your developers, you understand your systems. I know you can fix it. But to actually find the problem in a multi-service layered type system can be tricky. And I really hope that these tools will help you integrate with other APIs, publish your own, debug internal APIs, all those kinds of different things. So get to know your tools, take some time with them, ideally not when you're not under pressure, <laughs> because when you need them, then you'll be ready, you'll be ready to go. Um, that's the end of my formal content. I do have time for questions, so if anyone has any questions, this would be a wonderful moment. Anything you'd like me to talk about more or say again? The question I'm often asked here is about uh, which is the best tool. I've shown you all three because I use all three. Um, if you want to know more about this kind of stuff, there's a book on the slide behind me. Um, I wrote the PHP Web Services book for O'Reilly. I have checked, and Josette has it. Um, I also have some discount cards if you want to buy it online or just get the ebook. Come and see me because I have some business cards to give you a discount. I also mentioned the Charles article. My slides will be uploaded. Um, you really can't come up with a question for me? Like, not one person? OK, well, good. <laughs> I'm quite happy to just have a bit of a sit down. <laughs> I, d I don't feel like terribly good value, but that's, uh, that's OK. All right. So if you want to get in touch with me, then my contact details are at the bottom of this slide. You have seen rather a lot of the Joined In project in this talk. I would really appreciate your feedback. I don't know, particularly because no one's just talked to me, I don't know if this worked for you, if it was a good format, if it was helpful, if you'd learned something, or if not, any of the above. So if you could just take a moment to fill in some feedback for me on Joined In, I would be grateful. And around the rest of the day, I will definitely be in the bar later. So come and find me if you'd like to chat. And with that, thank you very much. <laughs>